stresses were at those two points A and B. Now, you don't have to take elaborate notes on this because I've put this up on Angel so you can see it. But there's something uh, in this business of finding out what the stresses are at A and B that we're going to need right now. Um, for this bracket, we're trying to find the individual stresses at those two points. And then, well, you can just see it on the top of the screen that says, and sketch on differential elements at these points. We're going to need that for the next uh, couple days with what we're going to do. Uh, what that means is um, at these two spots, A and B, you need to do the type of thing we've done before where you imagine a differential element at that spot. Uh, 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 a little piece of uh, only delta x by delta y or dx by dy, which I guess technically are actually smaller. Um, the whole solution is given for you there, and it's, it's not a whole lot more than um, figuring out, filling out the, the equations that we use for the different stresses and strains. First thing I had to do was figure out the internal forces at that phase, because it's those forces that determine what the stresses are combined with the section properties, which is just the pure geometry of the situation, and then the individual stresses were found for the different, different points. Uh, at each one, there's a little bit different section properties, uh, which is the main reason there's a change uh, for those. But for example, the top one across, uh, we're looking for the stress, the normal stress, at point A. That was partly due to this normal force. There was a uh, bracket there with a force being applied like that in the problem. That breaks into components like that. And it's this first component right here that's causing a normal force at point A. So that's what this N over A was. If you go back to the free body diagram, that's uh, this horizontal component N equal to the horizontal component of the force there. So it was just simply uh, uh, N was equal to, the, to 200, which is the, the horizontal component across here. And so it was a, a matter of doing that for the different uh, different pieces. The um, bending moment, the my over i, is zero because the cross section was simply rectangular, the neutral axis right down the center, and point A is right on that neutral axis. So there is no bending moment. Remember, the neutral axis is that point where there are no normal stresses due to bending. Uh, above, uh, it's in one direction. Below, it's in the other direction, depending on which direction the moment is. So that's why the uh, the bending stresses were zero there. So um, with that solution, then, for the normal stresses at A, 533 in tension, I can then draw that on this element. It's in tension. That's right, number 530. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing we're going to be doing uh, for the next couple days, possibly even a couple weeks, where we need to see what these particular stresses are on little elemental pieces, and then what we're going to do with those next, uh, starting today, is uh, one, if, if you ask anybody who's ever taken this course, if they remember the parts we're going to go over in the next two days, they'll uh, all immediately say, yeah, I remember that, I, don't, I couldn't do it on the fly right now, but I remember going over it. It's, it's that common and that important 
of a piece of, uh, well, the history of this, this uh, topic, if you will. Then the uh, second little part here at B, we did the thing, thing found out the normal forces. There's again still this, this horizontal force N that was causing a normal stress across the uh, whole cross section. So that's the same for both of these. Um, if there's a, a, a normal component to some force, remember that'll exert a constant. Or, well, we take it to be constant. It's a, it's a little bit variant across the cross section, but we we uh, already looked at the fact it doesn't cause that much trouble. And then the MC over I is uh, it's C because B point B is at the bottom point on the cross section all the way down here which is the farthest away point and when we're looking at the bending stresses remember those are uh, I keep my color scheme constant those are um, across linear across the cross section in varying uh, uh, varying linearly across the cross section and zero at the neutral axis. So this is point B down at the very bottom. It's got the maximum. That's why C is in there. The minus sign is in there. Uh, oh, I guess I drew it the wrong direction because these two are in opposition to each other. The uh, the uh, no, the force I called N uh, puts this cross section in tension. But the bending due to this, this force here actually, and you have to figure out the uh, effect of both of them, um, actually puts uh, the bottom in compression. So that's why there's a minus sign on that equation. This is a tensile stress, this is a compressive stress, and thus the minus sign between them. And you can usually gather that from inspection. That came out because I found that the bending is in this direction at that interface doing a free body diagram of the piece itself. Um, there's a horizontal component causing bending in one direction, a vertical component causing bending in the other direction, and it was the horizontal component bending at this <coughs> rate that was the dominant. And so uh, the total effect of M is compression at the bottom, thus the minus sign between the two. So now I have the uh, normal stresses at B, which was minus uh, 1,000 in compression. And so I can draw that in on the element B. <coughs> Just like that. Just as if we're doing a free body diagram on this little element, only we're drawing the stresses rather than drawing the uh, forces on these uh, differential elements. Then due to this transverse shear, we have to figure out what the shear stress is at each of these places. Um, that was dependent upon what Q is, and that little diagram will help. Uh, Point A was right in the middle, so its Q is based on the entire area above that point, away from the neutral axis. B is on the outside surface of the element at the very edge of the cross section, and remember the neutral axis is right down the center. B has no area beyond that, away from the neutral axis, and that was our area Q, and so thus uh, QA. Uh, it's calculated on the top half. QB is actually zero itself, making the whole shear stress zero on element B. And then we draw in those two little pieces. Uh, the shear stress at A is 600. So we put that in. And remember, We've already looked at the shear stress all the way around is the same. It had at least be that for both the force and the moment balance on that element. And uh, 
All we need to be concerned with is just what the directions are. And then there's no shear stress on B, so that element is complete. The only thing that possibly could have changed is if there was any, um, any equivalent uh, of this end force that might have caused some kind of downward force on either of the elements. For instance, if uh, maybe there was uh, some kind of object sitting on top of this bracket, then there might be some kind of uh, vertical component to these stresses. There just doesn't happen to be in this case. So what we're going to do in the next couple days, well, what we're going to do today and Friday is look very specifically at these stresses on differential elements, different places in the piece, and then uh, some of the other work we'll do is looking at uh, these type of compound loads here that actually contribute to the stress at different places in different directions, because this one adds both tension and transverse shear and bending, and we take account of all of those little pieces. But it's this little picture here that we need. So again, I put this up on Angel. So you can see the entire solution, uh, and you can step through it. But it's these little pictures here that we're going to need today and Friday especially to establish this little bit of, uh, of uh, the core strength materials that you can find any engineer in America who will immediately recognize uh, at least the general content of the work we're going to do today. So let's get to that. Now that you're all excited about it. <laughs> easy, folks. Easy. Don't get the... You know, maintain your composure. I know you're itching here. All right, so uh, let's back up to the general case of the type of things we're going to be looking at here. A couple of weeks ago, we established on a 3D differential element. So we've got, uh, in some direction, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And so this is a three-dimensional differential element of dx, dy, dz on a side. We did this a couple weeks ago, and we established from there what the general state of stress was on these, on these solids. Um, there might be some Normal stress in the x direction. I'll draw it as tension, but there's no reason it needs to be. Um, it's a uh, it's a it's an arbitrary choice I need to make as I draw these. So I'll draw it in tension. Uh, so on that face, there's uh, some kind of uh, some possibility of normal stress. And the problem we just did, we actually saw some normal stress in the x direction. There might be some normal stress on the in the y direction and in the z direction. Depends on what the problems are, what the loading is. That's what we saw <coughs> in the problem that was just on the board. Uh, that These stresses can even change for different places in the same piece just because the uh, variation of bending uh, across the cross sections. There might also be the possibility of some shear stress and remember, our convention was that we put which face it's on and then which direction it's on. So that's tau xy there. And I happen to draw it in the positive direction, but it uh, need not be a um, great concern because uh, it could be anything. So this is tau on the y face in the x direction. We have on the Z face in the Y direction, and then other components to those as well. And you can put them all on. Remember, the first letter is the face, second letter is the direction.
And then don't forget, all of that is on the back side too, where I can't really draw it. It would it'd be a, a terrible mess to try to sketch that in. Um, and then we also look at the fact that if you do a force and moment di uh, diagram on uh, force and moment balance on any of the directions that uh, the uh, companion shear stress was the same uh, for just the opposite face opposite direction for any of those. Is that supposed, um, to, sorry. Is that supposed to be tantalizing? Oh yeah, yeah no, this is supposed to be Y, yeah, X. X. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, we couldn't expect Travis to catch that. He's only halfway through his coffee. Uh, so it's also true for XZ and YZ and its uh, component. So I won't bother writing all those down. That's our generalized three-dimensional state of stress. Depending on what the problem is, <coughs> depending on just which way those arrows are uh, pointing in any problem, depending on whether we have compression or tension, etc. We, however, are going to generalize this even more. Actually, I guess it's not generalizing it more. We're going to specificize it more. If that's not a great word, I don't know what is. Good luck to my foreign viewers. We're going to keep this as a two-dimensional problem where we're only going to worry about the x and the y directions. We're going to take the z direction out of it. So our generalized state of stress is going to be nothing more than that. And we can do that by having our moments in the z direction only. Remember, that's the right hand rule for the moment direction, uh, which would put the thumb either in plus z or minus z, but that means bending in the xy plane alone. And um, only have x and y forces on the piece. There will be no, no z forces. Um, to start with, we, if we have sufficient time, we'll add a little bit to that. So rather than draw that two-dimensional problem in the 3D representation, we make it even yet a little bit simpler. Because then it does allow us to view the backside stresses that I can't draw in the three dimensional picture, just to remind us that these things are always in balance. Um, remember to, I have to draw them one direction or the other, so I'll draw tension, but it could very easily be either compression or those stresses could be zero, as we found out for the problem we just did, some of the other, some of the other forces were zero. And then the shear stresses across the face. In fact, uh, as often as not, we won't even add that xy, um, because all of those, remember these four shear stresses on the faces are all the same, as they must be for uh, for a, a moment and force balance. What we're going to do now, uh, and we touched on this actually several weeks ago. We did it when we were only looking at tension. We did it, it was something like the third week or so where we took just the axial loads that we were looking at that time. We had no other loads in the first week or two, even three of classes. We only looked at axial loads. But we took this differential element and looked at it at other angles. And if you remember, we discovered that uh, at 45 degrees, we're actually at the point of maximum shear across these faces. And uh, uh, 
no normal forces, if I remember. So what we're going to do now, we've actually touched on before. We're just going to do it in greater detail. What I want to open up is the possibility now of not looking at the stresses in the xy direction only, but look at what happened when we ourselves as analysts look at different angles for this differential element. We're not changing the load in any way. Remember, these stresses are caused by external loads acting on the, in, uh, causing the internal forces in the piece. But what about the possibility that there are greater concerns at other angles. This is an arbitrary choice of direction for this differential element to put it in the horizontal and vertical direction. We have already seen that if we do it at other angles, other stresses, uh, they don't appear because they're there anyway. It's just it gives us a chance to see them. So what happens when we put a differential element at an arbitrary angle, somewhat off-center in some way. And now look, what are the stresses, not in the x direction, but in the x prime direction, this new. And for, for a, a start, this will be an arbitrary angle. But what we're going to find very soon is there are specific angles of great concern that we need to look at. So we're going to find a way to come up with these stresses at different angles for our differential element. We're not changing the loading. We're not changing the orientation of the piece itself. We're just changing the orientation of the differential element that we are analyzing. This is a uh, purely a mental exercise at this time. We're not physically doing anything to the solid itself or to the, the loading problem that we're looking at. We're just going to put things a little bit on an edge and uh, see what these stresses are if we turn our an an element of analysis on a little bit of an angle. All right, so what we'll do here to get started is we'll, uh, we'll take a little piece of both differential elements so that we can see how they compare to each other. So we'll uh, pull this little piece out here. It's got... Uh, a little bit of the history of our original direction, and that's that's we're going to need that as a place to start. That's no different than uh, the kind of things we just came up with on the last problem, but it also allows us to get our new angle in there. So if we call that theta, that angle is theta there. And then we need to do what we always do. We balance the forces and balance the uh, moments. So let's see. We'll call that area delta A. Which makes this area there, the original y direction area delta A cosine theta. So we can relate the areas to each other because turning on this, ang this, this angle um, changes our uh, direct calculation of how much area these stresses are acting on. We need that to balance the forces. So that's just our, uh, our area look there. And then we'll take our differential element and add some forces to it. We'll balance the forces. That will allow us then to solve for these stresses 
at different angles than just simply horizontal and vertical. So we've got this for or this stress sigma x prime acting on that face. And again, remember I'm arbitrarily drawing it in tension, but it could be anything, even zero. And that's acting over an area delta A. So that's the force on the x prime face. And we can do the same thing for the other faces. So on the x, original x face, it's sigma x acting on an area delta A sine theta. And as you can suspect, when we go ahead and balance these, we're going to lose the delta A. So the actual size of the differential element is not the, uh, the effect here. And on the y face, we have a force of sigma y, the normal stress, Uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, Travis, you must be down past halfway in your coffee. Good catch. Yeah, sigma y in that direction, sigma x in that direction, times the area over which they're acting. So those are the, that's the force diagram there. And then we can do the same thing for the shear stress tau x prime y prime acting on an area delta a um, tau x y acting on an area delta a cosine theta on that face and same thing on that face as well so we get all the pieces this is tau xy delta a sine theta and so we can do now a force balance on that element and that will allow us to relate the original stress directions to our new arbitrary stress direction. And that way we can see are the stresses of greater concern at some other angle than just the original horizontal and vertical. Remember for pure axial loading we found the shear stress was at a maximum at 45 degrees. Something we would not have seen if we just sat at the original horizontal and vertical angle. Alright, so I'm going to condense a lot of this for you because what's left is uh, all um, algebra, including some trig identities. So summing the forces using uh, your favorite trig identities and I know you all have them memorized. Uh, you can, and I, I believe our book shows you the steps of all this if you want to follow the algebra, but that's not necessary. What we're trying to get down to is now an, a, rela a relation for the stresses in the other directions besides the horizontal and vertical directions. Then we can analyze those and see if there's other angles of greater concern than just the horizontal and vertical. So, made up of several terms once we get fi finished. Uh, that actually turned out to be the average of the two original stresses plus sigma x minus sigma y over 2 cosine. 2 theta, twice the uh, arbitrary angle uh, of new direction, the new analysis direction. And I just
just need to fit this in plus tau xy. So it's based, of course, on the original stresses. at the new angles. So there's the stress in the new x direction, the direction I'm calling x prime. Remember, nothing's changed with the problem itself, the original setup. The, uh, we have not turned the uh, piece we're analyzing. For the problem we just did, we had that bracket. We haven't turned the bracket at some angle theta. We have not changed the loading in any way. All we've done is change the angle at which we're making our analysis. Purely, uh, purely uh, our own mental effort. So that, that I'll call equation one. We'll need three because we need also sigma y prime and tau x prime y prime. So that, for some reason, is the next equation. Uh, I'm putting these in the order there in the book. Uh, not for any great reason. So minus x, sigma x minus y over 2, sine 2 theta. Make sure you get the pluses and minuses all correct, because otherwise you're doing a different problem. Plus tau xy cosine. 2 theta. That 2 theta, of course, is coming from the application of the trig identities. Uh, minus, minus, plus. Okay. It's looking all right so far. And then the sigma y prime we find from uh, sigma x plus sigma y over 2 minus sigma x minus sigma y over 2 cosine 2 theta minus tau xy sine 2 theta. So let me check those. Is I going to get the minus signs right or you're not going to? All right, that looks okay. All right, and there we've got now, based on an original problem with uh, ordinarily orthogonal <coughs> stresses, the sigma x plus the sigma y's and the tau xy's, we can now look at what the stresses are at any other angle of concern. So let's just step through it and see how it works, just so we run through it. So we uh, get some problem, just like the bracket problem we open class with. We analyze it, determine that the x stresses, normal stresses, are 10 megapascals. The y stresses happen to be compressive at 5 megapascals and the shear stresses now remember our convention on these this is the negative direction and we're going to need that Which one? The, the shear stresses there so uh, we have to set up all these little pieces here so just to make sure we get the minus signs right. Tension we take to be positive, so sigma x is 10 megapascals. Sigma y is compression, so that's a minus 5 megapascals. And tau xy, that convention there is our negative direction. Down on a positive face, Positive x base, we take it to be negative. So we can put all those in these equations. Uh, just to 
speed things up a little bit because uh, you don't know it yet, but several of these terms we're going to need again. So um, it's worth calculating them separately and putting them in. So we're, we're going to need the average stress. As you're, as you're going to see in a little bit, it's vitally important to some of the rest of the analysis we do. Well, it appears in two of the equations right there anyway. So you calculate it once and then you can just stick them in for that. Save yourself a little bit of trouble. And then this one I've defined myself just because I'm, I'm fantastic, fantastically creative at, at certain moments. But we've got this sigma x minus sigma y over 2 that appears in all three equations. So let's just calculate it once, give it a little name. It doesn't play as big a part in what we're going to do from here on as sigma average does, but it just is as a way to simplify things for you. It just makes these equations a little bit simpler. So go ahead and calculate that separately as well. And then you can plug those two, those into the three equations uh, yourself. So go ahead and uh, do that while I recast these equations in this uh, abbreviated format. It just makes things a little bit easier. It makes that, that equation just a little bit easier because we're uh, just uh, packaging together some of the stuff we, we've already done anyway. So you go ahead and start plugging those things in. See what we get make sure we understand what we're what we're getting oh I'm sorry and and do this at an angle of 45 degrees so that means X prime Y prime are like that remember the original loading does not change the original object does not change we're just going to take a look at it in a different direction and see if things uh, up here that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So just rewriting those equations using this uh, uh, slightly abbreviated notation. Sigma average we are going to need again uh, as we continue our, our look through this bit. Don't forget your minus signs. Each of those little pieces is important. Uh, but we've got them all correct here, so it's just a matter of putting them in. That sigma difference I put there, that's purely just a matter of convenience. I invented it's not the book. And uh, it doesn't play a big part in what follows, not like sigma average does. Alright, so figure out all those pieces, and then we'll put it all together.
taking a look at things at a different angle just to see if, if something a greater concern doesn't come up. numbers check with somebody else make sure you're getting the same thing we're looking for three different values in the new directions remember the loading has not changed at all the object being loaded is not changed at all we're just simply uh, tilting our head sideways to look at things. Kind of like they, all the, all the, uh, video shots on American Idol now. They tilt the camera sideways. And zoom in and out. Who goes to a concert and does that themselves? Well, you guys probably do. You're half asleep. Do you guys agree? Yes or no? For one. For one of them. And nobody's going to check with Chris because he does his in fractions. So he's no fun to play with. Bill? David, who'd you check with? Anybody? Tim and Joe. Hey, Joe. My name is Andy. Here's. Negative 
7.5 megapascals. So that's on a negative direction. Once we get that, it establishes all the other directions. Um, Uh, 7.5. Don't actually label it with the negative because then it's not clear if the arrow's in the wrong direction. And then for the last one, sigma y prime, you have somebody 8.5. So we see a normal tensile stress 8.5 in the y direction. At an angle of 45 degrees. Now, uh, just as a quick exercise, because these angles can start to get a little confusing. I want you to redo it for 120 degrees. No big deal, it's just a quick calculation. But I also want you then to sketch it yourself to show me what it looks like. Because not only do we have to come up with these numbers, we need to we need to picture where they are and what they're doing. This is the type of thing that those people who work with carbon fiber uh, worry about because there's a definite bias to that material because it's actually a weaved fabric. And so the angle at which you lay down the carbon fiber material has a great impact on the structure's ability to absorb the stresses in different directions. It's also a great concern with wood because wood is very much a, a directionally biased solid because of the wood grain. So just redo it real quick with 120 degrees and then make the drawing that goes with it. I don't doubt you can calculate these. I want to make sure that you can actually sketch them in as well. So I'm probably driving you nuts by saying it, but just past experience of teaching this. We're not changing the loading. We're not changing the object itself. We're just taking a different look at it, just tilting our heads a little bit as we analyze the problem after we determine what the original direction stresses were. And you can imagine this is very easy to set up as a simple program. In fact, if you put uh, uh, something at Google, you'll come up with a whole bunch of athletes that will calculate this for you uh, on the fly. Even, even some are better than others and will even make the drawing. But that's what I want to make sure you can do. Just do a couple decimal places, one or two. And most of the stuff the detail gets submerged in a factor of safety anyway.
check. Did you make your drawing? Oh, come on, that's... I know you can calculate these numbers, that's nothing. I want you to make the drawing. Sigma x prime... 395 megapascals. Sigma y prime 105. And tau x prime y prime is 9.5. So in this <coughs> direction of analysis, they're all positive. If you have a material that can't take a lot of tensile normal stresses, you might want to put it at 120 degrees and that's the material you're using for the solid. If you have wood that is not very good in tension, you can angle it a little bit. It might be a little stronger in the other directions if you put it in a the weaker direction line it up. Everybody get those numbers? Same numbers you got? Two of more. Two of more. That's for the meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad. I got nineteen point five, it's a nine point five. Nineteen point five? Nine point five is okay. All right, so we're going to go to anchor of Travis. Dave, you got those numbers, Joey. One out of three? Nope. One out of three. All right. Watch the minus signs. It's real easy. Screw up. All right. We've got those numbers. Now, the uh, X prime angle is at 120 degrees. So there's 90, 30 past that. Will be something like that. And so that then orients our solid. Remember, just a differential element. Something like that. X prime direction is positive 3.95. Y direction, also positive, but about half that size if you want to scale your stress vectors. That's easy. Positive normal stresses are easy to draw. X prime, Y prime, remember that's positive on the X base, which puts it in that direction. And that's a, a positive 9.5. So we have, I think that's the biggest shear we had on any of the directions we looked at. We started with 6, went to 7.5, now we're at 9.5. So if you have a material that's weak in shear, you don't want that material oriented at the 120 degree angle. That's positive. This? Yeah. At the, in the sketch or the calculation? Yeah, that's, that's the X positive, X prime face, we're going up on that face. Remember, this was the positive X face, we're going down on that, that was a negative. That's 
that's uh, j just an arbitrary convention. Uh, but arbitrary conventions work extremely well for us if we're consistent with them. So be consistent with arbitrariness. And then you're allowed to be arbitrary. Remember that when you become parents. Because there's nothing more fun than the power of being arbitrary with your kids. All right, everybody, everybody get to this picture. All right, so we're going to take the next step with it. And this is the piece. You can go to any bar right outside of an engineering lab on a Friday afternoon, and you'll be able to talk with the guys about this, which is just a really fun possibility in your lives, I'm sure, for social contact. Most of them are crying in their beer about the fact that you can't find Pong in a bar anymore when they're just getting good at it. All right, so I'll leave those pieces up there. We'll need those for reference. They're, uh... well, we're still going to use them. But here's the next step. I'm going to do a little bit more mathematics with them to get to our next spot. So we've got those equations there. So uh, I'll just write down what the steps are. Not go through the algebra. That's not the point of this course. So square one and two. Add them and then simplify, and you can imagine that those simple words are about uh, 45 minutes of algebraic calculating and the like. But the result, what we end up with is, uh, is uh, known throughout the world to anybody who's ever taken this class. So we get this, sigma x prime minus sigma x plus sigma y over 2, which is uh, sigma average. So we can put that in in a second. That quantity squared plus tau x prime y prime squared plus, uh, sorry, equals equals the quantity we call sigma difference squared plus tau xy squared. So we can simplify that with those, those little addition things there. Sigma x prime minus sigma average quantity squared plus tau x y prime squared equals sigma diff squared plus tau xy squared. Make sure I got all that right. Okay. Looks all right. All right, everybody got the pieces? Because here's what we do with this. Notice that this term, sigma average, sigma diff, and tau xy, those are all known from the original analysis. I give you a problem just like we opened class with. These things are all known quantities before anything has been said about some other angle. <coughs> Those are already known, uh, can be taken as input. These two pieces are the variables. Those are functions of the angle chosen, <coughs> which can be arbitrary, but won't necessarily be very soon. So 
we'll call those variables. So I'll give you a problem like we opened class with. You figure out the stresses in the ordinary orthogonal directions, horizontal and vertical. That sets these three values that I've marked known as uh, constants. Then you look at some other angle and the other two terms then become variables. So, we're going to rename one of those terms again. So, this on the right hand side, that's, that's a quantity that's known. That's a constant. No matter what the angle is, that value is already determined. So, we're going to call that R squared. So what I have are variables. We could call this one, uh, this variable x, call this variable y. Then you notice the equation we've got then is x minus a, where a is the average, squared plus y squared equals a constant that I've called R squared. That's just a very, very generic form of this equation. Do you recognize the form of that equation? Chris does, even without fractions. Anybody else recognize it? David, you do. What is it? seems to be a circle whose position in the x-axis varies. It's a circle with the center at a zero. Zero because there's nothing added on the y term. And of radius r. what's known <coughs> as Moore's circle after the engineer who first established it, Otto Moore, back in the, I believe, the late 1800s. And you can, you drop that in any bar frequented by engineers that still happens to be in business, uh, you'll instantly make friends. So let's, uh, let's figure out what more circle looks like. All right. Um, there's a step-by-step -step process in the book for how to draw more circle. I don't like it because it leads to really ugly circles. The easiest thing I think to do is to draw the circle first. And then we'll put in the axes and the known values and then we'll get a much better picture. It's much easier to draw the circle and then put the points on it. You just get a better sketch. But uh, the circle comes from the known quantities here. All right. We're going to put right through the center in the horizontal direction the normal stress axis with positive going to the right. And we know the center to be at A, and A is sigma average. So the center of the circle is at sigma average. I told you uh, 20 minutes ago or so that that was going to play a big part in what we were doing to come up with uh, uh, from here on. Uh, that establishes the center of our circle on the, on the sigma on the normal stress axis. Then in the vertical direction, and just where this falls depends upon the individual values, and we'll see that when we go through an example. In the normal, uh, the, the vertical direction, we'll put the shear stress axis. However, it's upside down. 
This is the positive shear direction. This is the negative shear direction. And I'll show you why we've done that in a couple minutes when we go through a problem. Now that circle is established by these known values. A is a known value coming into this analysis. R is also a known value coming into this analysis. Once you've done the original analysis in the horizontal and vertical directions, you've established this circle. Any other angle you choose will give you another point that lies on this circle. So all we need to do now is relate the angle of analysis to where it falls on that circle. But these all have a radius r. That's a known quantity once you've done the original analysis. We could have figured that out 10 minutes into class when I went over that first problem without knowing anything else about what we've done here. That would already be established. But that's a very important value because it is the same as the maximum shear stress possible in the problem. And if you add that quantity R to the average shear stress, you get the maximum normal stress as well. That, would, that point right there would be sigma average plus R. So R is as important as sigma average is. And if you subtract R from sigma average, you get the minimum stress possible. All right, so what I want to do is go through the problem we just did, because we already have all those numbers, and we can learn how to sketch out more circle. So, for the problem we just did, um, let's draw the original state of stress, the original calculated state of stress. So that was 10 in that direction, sigma x equals 10. And I think we had a sigma y is in compression, so that's uh, 6 megapascals, but I drew it in compression, so I don't know, also want to put a minus sign, because then that confuses the reader. There, the direction and the magnitude are all obvious. It was five? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, it was six in the uh, shear stress direction. And that was negative as well. But I drew it in the negative direction, so I'm not going to put the negative sign on it, because then you don't know if the arrow was drawn in the wrong direction or not. Okay, and then from those, we calculated sigma average, which was uh, 3.5, that, no, no, 2.5. And we can also figure now what R is. And that's equivalent to the maximum possible shear stress. However, what you don't know yet, what we don't know yet, is at what angle that occurs. And that's what we're going to use more circle to find out. So calculate that, if you would, real quick. So we got it. Square root of 
sigma diff tau x y each squared And we already have sigma diff, so you don't have to redo anything. We got tau xy from the original analysis anyway. And you get, what do you get for r? 9.6. r is 9.6? Yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Now we can draw more circle, and then we can figure out what the angles mean in it. So, draw the circle, put the horizontal axis through it, because that's not going to change. No matter what the problem is, the horizontal axis goes through the center there. We know the value of the center is 2.5, and so on uh, this particular Mohr circle, the units are megapascal, so we know that's a 2.5. We add R to that, which is 9.6, and we get this point here, which I believe is 12.1. Is that right? Subtract R from sigma average, and we get this other point on the other side, and that will allow us to put in the, the vertical axis then. And that value, oh, I didn't write it down. What is that one? 2.5 minus 9.6. 7. 7.1. 7.1. Negative 7.1. And now, the negative sign is important because, remember, we're trying to place the axes. So, uh, that's 9.6, and we want the zero point between there. No, yeah, that's, that's 9.6, and so that's 2.5. So, the vertical axis would fall right about there. And that, remember, is an upside-down shear stress axis. So now we know what the uh, maximum shear stress would be. However, we don't know at what angle that occurs yet. We haven't figured that out yet. Joe? How did you assign the vertical axis position? Is that arbitrary? No, no. It's not arbitrary at all. It has to do with these values here. That's where if sigma equals zero, because that's where the vertical axis goes. And if that's 2.5, and that's minus 7.1, it's about there. It's its precise location isn't terribly important. However, you don't want it in a completely wrong place because it's important to know that the minimum normal stress is uh, negative. We expect the minimum stress to be um, uh, uh, compressive in this case. All right, now. Here's how we relate that to uh, relate those maximum values to the original location and how we find out what angle these maximum stresses occur. So we take the values given, sigma x and uh, tau xy, and we plot that point. So it's at about 10 and about 6. So that puts us right about there. And our, our book, I believe, calls that point A. That's the original sigma x tau xy point. Remember, tau xy is positive down. See, what the book tells you to do is plot that point, plot this point, and then draw your circle. And you can imagine how difficult that is. It's a lot easier to draw the circle and then fit everything else to it. You get a much nicer drawing. Now that point there 
goes right through the center, and uh, I believe the book calls that point G back there, because it labels a whole bunch of points on these things. G. That's just, uh, that point is uh, uh, sigma Y uh, tau XY. Remember, that was compressive, so it's a minus. That's our up direction, so this is at minus 5. And um, uh, uh, distance tau xy. Okay, here's the deal. That now establishes for us the direction, the angle of these maximum stresses. There's some angle, and if we go to that angle, we're going to have these maximum stresses. Uh, we could be that's this point here. We need to know this angle between them. There's the maximum and minimum normal stresses. And we know what those are. This is 12.1 uh, megapascals. We know this is compression of minus 7.1 <coughs> megapascals. Remember, any point on the circle is a possible state of stress for our solid at all the different angles possible. Um, if we happen to be at this point of stress, then we are uh, at zero shear stress. So this is a point of maximum normal stresses, zero shear stress. And the angle at which that maximum condition occurs is two times theta on the, uh, the circle drawing. So this is theta there. It's not drawn quite to scale. So now we can take the circle, take the analysis, figure out where the maximum shear stresses are. You're saying that theta is equal to two times. Yeah. On on this circle, remember this circle was all established. Uh, every, everything in those equations was two theta. So that's. Be careful with that. But there's the reason we put positive down. Because now that and this are in the same direction. If we had positive up on the shear stress axis, then those would have been in opposite directions. And this can be confusing enough. Um, is it tau x y negative? So shouldn't point A be above No, it's, uh, tau x y. Oh, for this one, uh, yeah, I guess so. So, man, you could have come up with that a little earlier. Because that changes everything. But we'll go through it again. Draw our circle. Draw this uh, normal stress axis. We know it's going to be megapascals. The center is at 2.5, and then um, yeah, we're at uh, a point of 10 and negative 6, so it should have been, that's about halfway, puts it right about there. There's point A. There's point G. And our axis was about there. All right, so there is our axis, our, our angle to establish maximum uh, the direction of maximum
stresses, uh, normal stresses. So that's where we'd expect uh, in the x direction positive and the y direction negative and that's the angle in there. Where are you in your coffee there, Travis? You could have jumped on that just a little bit earlier. Okay, we can figure out just what that act, what that angle is, uh, because let's see, tangent of two theta. And by the way, this is called this direction is called the principal direction because it leads to the maximum stresses. So we call this angle theta p, the principal angle. We can analyze any other angle just by putting it on the drawing and going around the circle. Uh, this happens to be the principal direction and that's um, the, remember this is tau uh, xy and the x direction and the y direction is uh, sigma diff. I think that's the piece we need. And that's two theta. <coughs> so for our problem, we can figure out what it is then. The principal planes, that's what these are called, the principal planes, is one half the arc tangent of tau xy over sigma diff. And we've got both those numbers, which is why it's convenient to calculate sigma diff and sigma average ahead of time, because you're going to use them quite several times. And so for our problem, that comes out to be just a little under minus 20 degrees, right? Minus 19.3. And that's the minus angle we drew there. So we know if we go clockwise in our analysis, we'll find the direction of maximum normal stresses. There's also another angle we can figure that will give us the maximum shear stress, and that's actually just this direction, and that's called theta, this, no, this is twice that, this is called 2 theta s, it just happens to be the other direction. Well, it doesn't happen to be, if you look at the analysis, if we go 45 degrees, we've got the very same solid, just turned on a, on a different angle. So, the way to find that uh, principal plane is minus sigma diff over tau xy itself. Or you can take uh, 2 theta p and subtract it from 90 and you'll get uh, theta s. Uh, you'll get 2 theta s. Or you can take theta p and subtract it from 45 degrees because of the factor of 2 on the two of these. So I think that comes out to be 25.7 degrees. Yeah. And at that angle, there's x and 
and there's y at 25 degrees, which is about here. We're at uh, maximum shear stress, and in this case, turns out to be negative on that x space. So we're now at tau max for the shear stresses. Uh, if we move to an analysis angle of theta s, that would put us at the top and bottom point on our circle at the maximum shear stresses. And the normal stress is sigma average on all four faces, which in this case is positive 2.5. Could be negative, depends on where the circle falls for different problems. Oh, we're way over time. We're having so much fun. Yeah, I'd love to pay you time and a half. What? Quite a bit of fun. Okay. Uh, as you analyze these, some people are very comfortable with this circle. Some find it very confusing. You can do anything you need to do with the equations as well and just forget the circle. But you can you uh, Google Mohr circle, you'll come out with a hundred Mohr circle calculators on the internet. So you can always check your problems.